Okay, without much further ado, um, I'm going to introduce our day two MC. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, you, I could be accused of unconscious bias here because she also happens to be another Canadian. That was not planned. Uh, that was not, not, at least not consciously, maybe subconsciously that happened. But uh, Caitlin, is, uh, Caitlin McCochran is the events manager at Ovic Networks. She's been in the channel for three years and focuses on forming meaningful relationships with other channel vendors. Caitlin has a passion for event management that she leverages in her current role, which involves traveling globally to spearhead Avix channel events and connect with industry peers and partners. So, without any further ado, may I introduce your day two MC, Caitlin McCochran. I hope this is on. Is it on? Good. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. I really appreciate it. Um, so, did everybody have a good day one, I guess? Yeah? We're feeling all right after yesterday's party. Um, so I was lucky enough to sit on in a few meetings yesterday. We had some great conversations in the AWIT meeting, which was really good. Um, tons of great content this year. So I think this has actually been my favorite CCF so far. Um, awesome. Do I just move these, Jim? Yeah? Perfect. Thank you. So um, this is today's agenda. So just keeping in mind that these were developed by community leadership and staffs to focus specifically on um, the needs of the community. So we really want to maximize your guys' time in these meetings together and minimize the overlap. Um, so we have lots going on today, so try and get uh, to whatever you can. I just want to quickly remind everybody of the Raise the Virtual Roof contest. So we are doing a social media contest for CCF. Um, there's four categories, so social media rock star, Instagram paparazzi extraordinaire, um, ultimate LinkedIn network builder, and rookie of the year for all of you first time attendees. Oh, I have to go over the rules first, just in case. So it must be a public post, it must contain the hashtag CompTSCCF, um, and it must be awesome. So make sure that you guys are posting your best content out there. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our first session. So we have Charles Eaton. He is the CEO of Creating IT Futures, um, the IT future workforce charity created by CompTIA. Charles focuses on building better on-ramps to tech careers, whether that means working with out-of-work adults or inspiring middle school kids. Um, he's going to do a focus session on innovating appro sorry, innovative approaches to addressing the skills gap. So without further ado, here's Charles. Thank you. All right. So this morning we're going to talk about everyone's favorite topic for the last eight years, right? Skills gap. It seems like we never stop talking about this. And it's only becoming, I think, even more relevant because it's more of a seller's market, right? If you have a bit of skills right now, you're demanding higher wages. And this is across every industry, not just IT. I read the other day that uh, wages went up um, about three and a quarter percent. Um, and that's about the largest we've seen in really, really long time. So, you know, as all of you sort of representing yourself as employers, um, this is a very interesting time. And I'm sure you're paying more than you uh, had imagined you'd be paying for talent or you're not finding the talent. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what's going on and some of the solutions that people have. Uh, I hate to kind of ruin it for you, but there's not a ton of innovation, right? It's a lot of doing the things you've heard about and committing to them and keeping those going on a very consistent basis year after year. Uh, some companies are doing some unique things. I'll show you some uh, software tools that are out there. But for the most part, it's going to come down to you making the effort, right? And you know, I think for a long time, we relied upon the education system uh, to, to supply us with the right folks. Now it's up to the employers to make some of the change they want to see in this system. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. So the first thing is, I don't know if you all saw this headline uh, back in February. Uh, it was all over articles everywhere. But you know, the skills gap is a lie. Right? So what some researchers found was that if they, when they went back and looked, they found that during the recession, um, people who had you know, degrees were higher valued, right? So the requirements for different jobs and education and experience went up during the, the, the peak years of the recession. And then as people started getting jobs, the requirements declined. 
So that, what I was saying is that employers were kind of increasing what they wanted because there were just a lot more people in the market, right? a lot more people that they could choose from. So they were being picky. And then as people you know, started to get other jobs, there's fewer people and they stopped being a little less picky. But that doesn't really jive with what you all know, right? You know, during that time, did you feel like there wasn't a skills gap recently? Did you, everyone had just a great time hiring, right? So something else is going on, and it's not just IT. Um, this is survey, just as uh, in like May of 2017 that CompTIA did. We found, you know, of course, people are very concerned or somewhat concerned about the skills gap. And the larger the size of the company, uh, you know, the more overall uh, concern there is, um, you know, at the top level, at the very concerned. So people are still very you know, concerned that they aren't finding the right talent. We also found that what they're looking for is they're expanding, right? They're adding new headcount. Uh, the need for skills in new areas was growing. They were struggling to find people in AI and blockchain and some of the areas that you would expect. They're looking for people with soft skills, right? We all know that. Um, and there's a lot of intense competition and higher salary expectations. Uh, I noticed this, I was working with a, uh, a nonprofit program where uh, a company was hiring people who had been trained out of this nonprofit program and everyone knew going in what the uh, salary was. And then the company found that once they finished the training, employees were asking for 10,000 more to get started. All right, so just right away, they hadn't even had day one on the job, no experience in this field, and immediately they were asking for 10,000 more and many of them just went somewhere else. So the company that paid for all the training didn't actually get the people who were being trained. Right, so it's kind of, a, a, again, a seller's market. You also see this in emerging tech. Right? This is a huge area for many of you. I'm sure you're trying to get people who know a little bit about these areas of big data, drones, blockchain. So we're seeing an increase in the number of job postings asking for those skills. And then job postings have uh, gone up. So for a while here, we, you, know, you can see the, the, the chart. They all stayed roughly within a range. And then in the last uh, quarters of you know, 2018, things really started ratcheting up. So over 800,000 job openings. Now these are job openings, right? But uh, th that's not exactly saying there's 800,000 jobs out there. There's a lot of variation in that. But what it's telling you is all of a sudden we're starting to see a big spike, right? Huge need. Every company is a tech company. You all know this all the time. And if you ever want to uh, really dive into an area like security, you can look at uh, CompTIA's CyberSeq tool, uh, which will show you where the people are who are certified in the security fields and those who, uh, and where the jobs are. And you know, most of the major metros in the US, you'll see that big gap, right? There's a lot of jobs and not a lot of people with the certifications. So what's this all mean, right? We talk about the skills gap. You know, how can the skills gap have been a lie and at the same time, we're seeing all these issues. It's mostly because the skills gap isn't just one gap, right? It's a collection of gaps. It's a series of things that we see that are inhibiting the easy transfer of skills to the workplace. So you get a few things like the trust gap, which is, uh, I have coined that one. It's where you as an employer don't want to hire someone who doesn't have a lot of experience because you're not sure what you're going to get. Right? So if they've just come out of a training program like our IT Ready program, you're just a little bit concerned. And the generation gap, people's behavior on the job, uh, maybe they're younger, you know, it doesn't match up with what your expectations are because you guys are in different generations. There's the pay gap, obviously some they want more, you want to pay a different rate. Location, you can't find people in certain areas, so there's a real mismatch there. And then of course the supply gap, which is just not having enough folks. Um, I'm going to focus today, talk a little bit more about the confidence gap, which is uh, a big one on where, why people aren't even entering this field, why aren't they trying to find the training. Um, the awareness gap, and that's kind of a, a self-awareness by the companies that, uh, you know, you've got to learn who you are before you can start hiring. And the pipeline gap, which is, you know, again, what starts in the beginning and um, what we're seeing in terms of young people entering and new entrants to the workforce who are career changers. So it's a lot of things that require a lot of different solutions. <clears throat> there's not gonna be one answer to all of this. And sorry to say there's no silver bullet. So it's March, right? 
Has anyone done a basketball reference in these sessions? Not yet. Not yet. Wow, amazing. I get to be the first. Yay. Um, yeah, so it's like I was gonna always joke, you know, it's March at a conference in the U.S., right? You got to reference basketball. But I am not going to be referencing college basketball, right? We're going to be talking about the NBA. Because basketball is about the most efficient talent identification system that I can find. You have, at the very young age, millions and millions of kids around the world playing a game, many of them with the hope that they would be LeBron, right? Kobe. I think some still think Jordan, right? I don't know. I just wondered, like, is Jordan as relevant to these guys? But you go to China, and it's Kobe, right? Kobe is a god in China, along with uh, Stefan Marbury, which if anyone follows basketball, it's like amazing that this guy has made a second career in China, he even has a museum in China for his uh, accomplishments there. Um, but they have this system where you get all these young people, and then you start to filter out, right? You start to find the ones who have talent. Now, certainly height is an advantage. My son uh, is 11 years old, and he just finished his uh, basketball season. And he was playing against kids uh, who are my height at five foot nine, and some were up to six feet tall. And it was crazy because uh, these kids really did play like uh, teenagers, and they were 11 years old. Right? So the, the, the system finds these kids, does a great job, and then it cultivates them because you have youth coaching, you have AAU, you have high school, and then, of course, you get the college recruitment process. And then it filters down to the, you know, it's 30 teams, 15 players on a team. People come and go. Maybe 550 people get to play in the NBA every year. And not a whole lot, right? But you've gotten millions and millions of people excited about your product. Now they become fans. But they also are always thinking, you know, younger on, hey, maybe I can make it, all right? Wouldn't that be nice in our world? if we had tens of millions of people who wanted to come and work for our companies. And even if they, let's say they all wanted to go work for Google, right? Let's say Google was the MBA. Um, there are great places they could go if they didn't get into Google. And when you play in basketball, what happens, right? You, you end up going overseas into these smaller leagues where you're not making as much money. You might be a Stefan Marbury, become a god in China, right? But that's a little bit more rare. And, uh, and so, you know, it's just a, a, it's kind of a very different system. Now, I'm not saying we could replicate that. But I'm saying there's some lessons that we can draw from that, and that's what we're going to talk about. All right, I'll get it out of the way right now. That's my team. I'm a, I'm a Duke Blue Devil, right? You can, my, wife, my wife said, just, just throw the haterade at me right now. Um, so this is my time of year, I hope. I hope, fingers crossed, right, that we'll see another national championship. Um, so I think the first thing you've got to do as a company, right, to solve this problem is you've got to know who you are. And you, you know, when I say that, I mean, You've got to understand how your business works, how you hire, who those people are who hire, and, and what they're all about. So continue the basketball analogy. Anyone know who that guy is? Oh, man, I could not. Yeah, Shane Batty, right? There we go. OK. So, so Shane uh, won um, championship for Duke back in 2001. And uh, he went on to, to play in the NBA several teams. A uh, very, very smart guy. He won two championships with LeBron in Miami. But he's always known as kind of a very heady player, right? And uh, so when he finished his career trying to find out what to do, um, he was very interested in data analytics. There's a cool article uh, written by uh, Michael Lewis of Moneyball fame about Shane and how he processes information and gets data. Like he would always push Kobe Bryant over to one area of the court. Now Kobe would score but he would score at his lowest possible percentage in that area. All right, so it's things like that. So Shane is now the um, head of basketball analytics for the Miami Heat. He's the first player to play a role like that. Right? But why are they doing that? Because they want to get just that continued competitive advantage and know who they are. Uh, if you've been watching basketball at all for the last few years, you know that the, the, the position that everyone wants to get is called the stretch four. Right? It's this, Tall guy, you know, 6'9 to 6'11, really long arms, over, overly long wingspan, who can shoot a three-pointer. Because unfortunately, if you love the game, you might not love what's happened. It's all about layups, dunks, and three-pointers. Everything else is inefficient, right? And so it's all about getting that efficiency. But not every player can do that at that height. 
So it's a matter of finding out, you know, how do you change your system to fit the players that are out there? How do you recruit? Who should be training for? All of that. So Shane is in charge of that. Now this is my wife next to Shane. We, uh, we were at an event uh, together where he was a keynote speaker and she was running the event. So I got to spend about 20 minutes with him one-on-one uh, -on -one just talking, talking basketball, talking analytics and, and everything that he's doing. Of course, the hardest thing for him is he's trying to really understand his business. But now he's got to convince coaches who haven't been running with numbers in the same way uh, that his analytics will make a difference and help them win more games. Right? So that's kind of, kind of what they're doing. But this is something that everyone should be doing. Right? Um, there are a series of tools out there, software tools, that will help you do different things in HR and recruitment. Uh, one that's up in the corner there under the kind of the AI and automation, I think is kind of cool, it's Textio. Uh, Textio will, will take a look at your job ads and will help you understand if your job ads are maybe biased, a little you know, skewed towards one gender or the other, or they have some kind of biased language. Uh, so, for example, you know, if you're writing your job ads like, we kill the competition and we destroy our enemies, right? And then they might come back and tell you, that's a little aggressive and a little masculine, right? You might not be getting as women, many women as you want in your applicant pool. So that's a pretty cool one. But there's a lot of these tools that are out there, um, each of them trying to tackle a different aspect of this recruitment and pipeline issue. But sometimes you gotta be careful, right? So Amazon apparently came up with a, uh, a pretty cool tool uh, and they tested it on, you know, people who worked at Amazon, right, who were mostly men in this field. And so, of course, the AI came back and said, you know, we should have a preference for men, right? And, and that's how these things work. Uh, um, you know, I think if anyone saw uh, a couple years ago when the chat bots were out there and everyone just threw tons of really horrible stuff at the chat bots, right, to teach them all the wrong things and they had to shut these chat bots down. Right, it's the same kind of thing. You've really got to uh, watch these solutions and, and you've got to watch for, for bias in anything you use. Um, so what can you do? How can you know yourself better? Right? And uh, I'll give you a few little tips here, but I'll just start with a real quick story about this. Um, I have about 30 employees right now working for me. We were six, uh, three and a half years ago. So we've grown a lot. But as we were hiring, I needed to figure out, you know, what was it that made people successful? So we didn't need to go, you know, too deep in the analytics. I don't have a very big pool of people to draw from. But I wanted to see, you know, what, what were some of the personality things that were a bit of a problem? And what I was able to kind of figure out was everyone who didn't work out with us, and it wasn't many, we were talking like four people, but none of them could trust others, right? This was kind of a critical thing. They, they didn't know how to trust other people. It wasn't that I couldn't trust them. It's just they couldn't collaborate. They always wondered about other people's motivations. Um, and so once you know, with those folks had moved on, we said, yeah, let, let's try to hire for that, right? So we set up a, a, a pool of behavioral interview questions that you have to use. Uh, everyone's got different questions. You have to be interviewed by at least three people. Those people get back together and they compare notes. And the questions all lead you to five core uh, behaviors and traits that we look for in our employees. Um, and since we've done that uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, I think everyone has worked out great, right? It's made a lot of confidence in the system. But that took us knowing who we were. And then it took us really knowing who we were, right? Number two there is that you can think you know who you are, but then you've got to really drill down and say, is that the truth? Is that what's making us successful? I often tell a story about uh, an MSP I was uh, talking to out in California. And you know, he's telling me, decrying the fact that he doesn't have enough women on his team. So I asked, like, what kind of interview questions do you use? And he said, well, the number one thing, I mean, all my people, my best people, this is always the case, every one of them has built a gaming rig. And I'm like, oh, OK. So gaming rig to you now associates success, right? But how many people, and especially women, aren't building gaming rigs, right? And so immediately, with that one question, he has eliminated a huge potential pool of applicants who could done, have done great. So he thought he knew himself, but he really didn't, right? He needed to dive a lot deeper into that. Take a look at those new tools. I think that's a, that's a good uh, suggestion. You know, there's things that are out there that can make this easier, give you the data. At least you can start gathering it if you're hiring a lot of folks. And you need to understand how you can 
increase your diversity and reduce the bias. Um, and we had a great session at the uh, diversity community yesterday. Uh, I highly recommend anyone who wants to learn more about how to do that and to kind of eliminate unconscious bias uh, to talk to a vet uh, and attend that community. Uh, they're doing some really great things. Because you know, it's clear I could go on all day about this, but it's very clear that if you have diversity, your company is more successful, right? All the data is telling us that. And if you are not reaching out and bringing more diversity in your company, you're missing out on a huge talent pool. Because right now, what most of you are probably doing is hiring someone who works at another company kind of like yours, right? And all we're doing is transferring these people. We're not bringing enough new people into the industry. But number, number five is probably the best one, right? When you're worried about you know, turnover, uh, other issues on retention, you gotta ask yourself, is this a great place to work? Right? Yeah, you think maybe I pay well, or I have you know, a couple benefits, but have you given people purpose? Have you given them mission? Have you given them something where you know, you know at the end of the day they're feeling really good about why they work there? Right? Because number one thing that people wanna see is, do I have a purpose? Am I doing something with where I work? Right? And that's kind of the key to all of that. So I think you can stem that stuff by saying, how can I make myself a great employer? And don't worry about training. We'll talk a little bit about that later, right? If you train people, if you're a great company, they're not gonna leave. Um, I'm always proud to work at CompTIA because we we're always named one of the best places to work in Illinois. But I think part of that is because uh, we take care of folks. We don't have much turnover, right? People want to stay here and work because it's a good environment. We're also mission focused, right? Helping the industry or creating IT futures where we're helping people get jobs. Let's make sure I'm on track here. Um, encourage fanatical learning, right? So this is a, a, a term I'm coining and I'm, I'm putting it up here today so that it, uh, if anyone ever uses it again, I've got uh, copyright preference, right? Um, it's the idea of lifelong learning. We talk about this all the time, what is lifelong learning, right? But um, you know, I'm saying you gotta be crazy about it, you gotta be a fanatical individual when it comes to this because everything changes, right? So if you're in the workplace, your job is going to change significantly year to year in ways that it hasn't before. And the only way to keep up is through constant learning. So we'll get back to the basketball analogy. So these three players, we've got Damian Lillard, Paul George, Steph Curry, right? Thing that you would recently that they have in common is they were all NBA All-Stars this year, right? So they voted by fans, the uh, coaches, and players as to be the very best of the best. But coming out of high school, no one was recruiting these guys, right? So Steph Curry went, went to Davidson, and uh, even though his dad played in the NBA, he was this amazing shooter, right? Everyone. Uh, slept on him because of his size, you know? And then Damian Lillard, he played at Weber State, right? No one was recruiting him. Paul George, I think it was like Cal State Fullerton. And, um, uh, you know, during their time, though, they worked really hard, right? No one works, you know, as hard as like Steph Curry on his shot and his dribbling and all of that. And all, both those guys, I mean, all three of these guys, they worked so hard during their time in college and then into their time in pros, you know, all three of them were drafted in the, in the top 10. All right, so it doesn't mean, you know, some, some of the time, right, you'll find that people do get missed by even the most efficient systems. Uh, but in the very end, by the time it came to get a job, the system had found the right people, right? It had developed them. But these guys developed themselves. And so that's what it is about fanatical learning, right? This is when, you see people working at companies of small sizes and large sizes. This is really what they want, right? This is how they think they can sort of solve this skills gap internally. And it's so much about, you know, this education, um, getting the training, being encouraged to do this uh, by your company, right? That needs to be part of your culture right now is that you're encouraging people to learn. And again, like I said, you can't be afraid they're gonna leave you because that's just how it's gonna be at this stage. You're not gonna solve this problem without doing that. And it also is one of the things that will retain people. Um, so you know, we give incredible benefits like you know, around training and education at, at CompTIA. Um, and again, it's one of those things that keeps people around. 
millennials are offering up a lot of insight about this, right? They want more cross-training. They want more follow-up and alignment. People want clarity. And I think this is one of the, the messages that we're hearing now, especially with more millennials in the workplace. I need clarity. I know what my purpose is. But they also want time set aside for training. You can see some of the uh, other things they want to, uh, you know, want to focus on there. Student loan repayment right? its the highest benefit right now. Um, you know, we saw this uh, Starbucks did this a few years ago, allowing their uh, baristas to, uh, to get college uh, educations, um, continue their, you know, college if they're already in it. Fidelity is pushing the envelope here as well. And you're seeing um, student loan repayment. You're seeing people uh, pay for people to you know, go back to college. You're seeing all varieties of this. Um, but I think this is definitely one of the hot benefits you need to be paying attention to because your competitors will. So what can you do? I think making that reimbursement a benefit is uh, absolutely something you should take a look at, even if it's a little bit. It says a lot. You've got to be generous in covering training and education. You know, make sure people are getting certified. Give them pathways. Uh, I know uh, Amy Cardell is here, and she does an amazing job at her company, Clever Ducks, of uh, showing, you know, there's a, there's a board in their, in their break room, in the kitchen, right, which just shows um, everyone on their pathway to new certifications, you know, when they're going to get it, right? So it's very visible inside their company. And that's just a, a small thing, but that means a whole lot in the workplace. Um, You've also got to know, and that's also part of what your, uh, Amy, what your uh, board is doing, is showing what a career pathway kind of looks like, right? People want to know where they're going to end up. And that's got to work for them internally and externally. Right? You can't be doing things that are just about how you work inside your company. You've got to be conscious that these individuals who, especially the younger ones who you're hiring now in their, in their first roles, they're not going to be with you forever. Right? So how can you make sure they're going to be successful later on? If you've done that, you know, all the data says that individuals would be very loyal. Right? They're, going to be, you know, they're going to be your best spokespeople when they're out there, even if they live. And that's why I say on number four, don't be afraid to let someone go to grow. Right? Sometimes you're not going to have that right job for them. Um, you're not going to need someone at a higher level. And you don't want to get in that position where you're creating work or creating a job or paying someone something that doesn't make a lot of sense for your business. Sometimes the best people will be ones who will go and they will get new jobs and they may become your customers. They may boomerang back to you right, later on when you need them. Um, but I think you've got to be very open. Right? This idea of, of, again, everything is not about containing your folks right, and protecting them from the world. You, you've got to show that you're part of their journey. Right, and you're helping them along in their tech journey, in their growth. So the last point we'll make today is about inspiring and developing talent. And this is a fun one. You know, there's a lot of ways to do that. I'm going to give you just a, a few places that we do it. Um, back to the basketball analogy. Right? So again, fully developed system, AAU, all of that. But the NBA felt like, you know, well, we're, we're kind of missing out. All right, for a long time, they didn't know much about Europe. And so now there's a much more robust system, higher quality of play at the professional levels in Europe, lots of NBA scouts. They know who all the best uh, uh, players are in Europe. That's a very well understood system. Luka Doncic was like third or fourth pick this past year um, out of Europe playing in the league. So you know, there's video, there's all these things that we didn't have before. Um, but they still said, you know, we're missing Africa, right? We're getting some really great players like Joel Embiid um, who are coming from Africa, and the college ranks are, you know, kind of filled with a, a lot of African uh, players, right? But we don't really know who we're missing. So they've started up, um, I think it starts in 2020, uh, a league in Africa, Basketball Africa League. That's the NBA. President Obama is involved in this. And it's just going to be another way of finding and sourcing talent and growing up an opportunity there for people to play where maybe they're not all going to be NBA players, but maybe they can play in this league. All right, so think about that. Like that that's just a great system there. They've been killing it in China. Basketball, number one sport in China. Right? And this is despite the fact that they're selling uh, a lot of people um, on coming to China for soccer. All right, so if you see some of these contracts of soccer, they're just enormous to get some big players there in the Super League. But the NBA still is king. 
and you know NBA players go over there and they make a ton of money in the off season on appearances and playing with the kids. And eventually, you know, we're starting to see a lot more talent come out of China. We've always seen the really, really big guys, right? And that's been about it. We haven't seen the guards yet, but that will develop over time. And then the NBA created the G League, which is uh, used to be called the, the D League, the Development League. Now it's the Gatorade League, right? And uh, it's actually got some interesting elements in, in terms of how they have like two-way contracts. You can come up and play for 10 days with the NBA team and then go back. And it gives some uh, a little more sense than like the minor league baseball system does to you know, what your future is going to be. Right? So they've done all these things despite having this very robust system. They're never stopping developing and trying to find talent. So uh, I think Nancy announced this uh, yesterday that uh, Creating IT Futures acquired Tech Girls, uh, which was you know, one of the coolest things I, I think that we've been able to, to do in a while. Um, tech Girls focuses on middle school girls. And through these tech shops in a box, which volunteers run, they attempt to inspire uh, young women to consider careers in tech by showing them the breadth of all that tech can be. Right? So it's not just about coding. And, and I think that's always a message uh, when you see Todd Thibodeau and I talking about these things, right? We're not anti-coding, but it's just so much more, you know? And uh, you certainly know this, right? Your businesses aren't driven entirely by code. Um, there are so many fields of cybersecurity, data analytics, business analysis, uh, project management, things that people go into. And so Tech Girls workshops do this. There are groups like this all over the country. Not many, honestly, that focus just on girls or also focus on the breadth of tech. Most focus on coding, but there's a lot of STEM groups, right? So those are things you can get involved in. Um, you know, we hope to uh, scale this so there's a lot more activity, uh, you know, in your local area, how you could do it as a volunteer. But um, these are the kinds of, of opportunities that are out there that one could focus on when talking about building this pipeline, because we've got to start building it early. Right, we're missing too many people uh, as the filters happen. Um, and the filters are self-selected. You know, girls just drop out of the STEM fields by the time they get to high school. They need to be inspired here. So we did a lot of research, and Tech Girls, we, we found, was really had the, uh, had the best formula. Um, Got to be thinking about kids in urban areas, right? The ones who aren't in the fields and aren't represented as much. They want to be in tech careers, too. They just don't have as many opportunities to get there, right? They don't have the, the role models. They don't have other things like that. But you can see, you know, when asked about careers, and this is some research my team did uh, across the U.S. with, with uh, kids in urban areas, and, um, you know, they, they love these ideas. They don't even, a computer design engineer, I don't guarantee you no one even knew what that was when we put it on that list, right? But it sounded good, you know, just as being a doctor sounds good, right? These are things that they uh, aspire to. This is where we're talking about this confidence gap. You'll see how many people, right, are concerned. They don't have what it takes um, because no one's been building them up. You know, they're afraid of failure, right? We got to give lots of opportunities for people to know that you can fail in this industry. It's totally fine, right? You've got to get on this pathway. And that last one, one that always bugs me, right? You don't need that four-year degree. Someone should have told that to uh, the uh, people who just got arrested uh, for, uh, for bribing, right? Yeah, it's like, wow, getting into, I mean, you could have bought a building with some of the money that those people contributed in the bribes. You know, why, that, that, that's just crazy. As my dad and I were texting about it last night, and you know, he was uh, jokingly decrying, wow, what, what kind of world are we in where rich people can't buy their way into universities? You know, it used, to, he, it used to be much simpler. They didn't have to be a middleman, right? Um, so, uh, you know, but these are the things that you understand that this is what the young, younger people who are trying to figure this out and career changers, and that's what we deal with a lot in, in our IT Ready Adult program, right, is these career changers, and they just have a lot of doubts. They don't think they can do it. They think it's too hard. Right? And I think this, this emphasis on coding has also put a lot of people off because coding seems a lot harder right? than other, than they don't know the other field. They just say, wow, coding is really hard. And, or they might not enjoy it. We've got to get them out to understand there's so much more. And you know, when people ask me, like, what's the secret sauce of our IT Ready program? How do we get so many adults? Because we've trained you know, over 1,000 people and put them into IT jobs in the last six years. Um, 
I say is that we build their confidence, right? That's all we're doing for that eight weeks. We're giving them technical training and soft skills, absolutely. You know, not, not saying downgrading that, but we're putting them in a classroom of other people who are in a similar situation. And I always go into these classrooms at different points, right, around the country. So I go in like week two and it's like deer in the headlights, like, oh, I don't know if I can make it. And then I get there in the last week, week eight, and it's the cockiness of, yeah, I can't wait to get my job. And we have people turning down jobs, right, at that point. You know, they're, they're, they're getting multiple offers. So it's all about building that confidence. And like I was saying, even if you get started late, you can still make it, right? Look at those career changers. Don't think you've just got to go and work with people who are, this is their first role or their first job, uh, you know, anywhere, right? We love the career changers. All these guys, Joel Embiid, Dennis Rodman, and Hakeem Olajuwon, you know, Olajuwon Hall of Famer there, they all started either Dennis was, started playing basketball in high school and the other two didn't start playing basketball until they're 15 years old. Now sure, those two guys are, you know, six foot 11, seven feet, right? So that helps, you know, it's always easier to start when you've got some advantage, um, but it's never too late. And, you know, we've been training people who are in their 50s and early 60s and finding them roles in this industry. When it comes to new ways of thinking about this pipeline issue, though, uh, here are three organizations that I think are doing some pretty interesting stuff that you, you want to take a look at and consider. And let me just make sure I am on time. Jim, I'm looking good? Okay. So um, Tectonic up in the top left there, they started a program. They were having that same problem that many of you are having. People were leaving them for five, 10,000 more, right? Software development. It's just all transactional, right? It's a commoditized system. They just go from one company to that. It didn't much matter. And Titanic was tired of that. They're a pretty small software development firm up in Boulder. And so they decided, you know what? We're going to create an apprentice program, right? We're going to build, home grow our talent. And one of the things they found in doing this was not only were they getting new talent, they were exciting their talent that they already had because now those people were becoming mentors and guiding and running this apprentice program. So they have recently expanded this significantly. And it, uh, they got a huge investment from a firm called uh, University Ventures, a venture capital firm, right? And they're expanding this. Uh, another firm that University Ventures uh, uh, has funded is Reverture. And uh, anyone heard of Reverture? I don't know if it comes across your radar much. But what they've done is say, look, we're going to get people who have just finished college. We're going to go to these colleges, put you back on campus for a summer, give you 12 weeks of very intense training, and then we're going to have you start working on real projects for real companies. Right? So Reverture is making its money from their clients, and that's how they're able to pay for this training. And these individuals are now getting their experience. And many of them will continue on, but the, uh, you know, at the company or others, they'll go off and Reverture just has a cycle of a whole bunch of new folks, right? Pretty interesting business model. Like my thing's telling me I've got almost time here. Um, Apprenti is a nonprofit working to develop apprenticeship programs. So, you know, if you haven't considered apprenticeships, uh, this is something that will probably be on your radar more in the next couple years. And it's a, just, again, about hiring someone, getting them trained, and then to continue to train them along the way. And the cool thing is you get to pay them legally, can pay them less than they would normally be achieving if they had been an experienced person in that same role, right? So huge advantage. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I've been working with Cognizant, and one of the things they've been doing is working with nonprofit partners like us to find pipelines into their system, right, and create training programs. Uh, you know, if you want to talk about someone who's done this really well, you got to talk to Angel Pinero right here, because Angel has hired probably, when we were talking, maybe 2,000 people who have come out of the Pascola's training program, very similar to IIT Ready, in New York City, given an incredible opportunity to these individuals uh, to be able to, uh, you know, change their lives. So what can you do? We'll finish up right here, right? You can volunteer. Like I said, there's lots of these STEM organizations out there. You can volunteer. But what you got to do is you got to share what you love about what you do, right? Don't share what you do. They don't want to hear about your day-to-day -day work. That's not going to make a lot of sense to a young, uh, you know, a middle schooler or even a high schooler. They got to see your passion, why you love what you do, right? And this is all the research we did. We found that to be the case. 
you got to let your voice be heard right at the high school community college. If you want CTE programs to be doing the, the kind of training and certifying their kids that will make sense for your business, you've got to let them know that you need that. Right? The, the, the education system needs to know what you want to hire for. You've got to provide knowledge to the of the industry to these teachers. Most of the teachers out there have not been in the industry or have not been in, in a long time. All right, so it behooves us to make sure that we're always reaching out to them. We're going to be training a lot of teachers in uh, IT fundamentals uh, this summer and as our first step into doing some of that. You've got to open your doors for job shadowing. And if you can, you've got to consider these other ways of hiring, internships, contract to hire, and apprenticeships. Right? So like I said, there was no silver bullet for you. Right? It's just hard work. And all of these little elements, right, you start to do these things, they will pay off in the end. But, you know, there's not one of these will probably be your sole answer. You've got to do a lot of them. And so sorry to, to give you that sort of message of, you know, it's not going to be that easy. I don't have a software tool that will solve everything. But we're seeing companies who are doing great with all of this. And they're small and they're large. And, you know, I call out to Team Logic IT, one of our supporters. But they've been hiring our students as we've expanded IT Ready. They've been hiring our students in all of their markets. Uh, and those are, you know, franchise MSPs, smaller, right? But the, the talent needs are there. And, uh, you know, you can find programs like ours uh, in a lot of cities. Uh, you just have to kind of hunt them down. So thank you.